be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Road Home Podcast with Ethan Nickturn. Join Ethan as he and his guests explore the Buddhist path as it relates to art, culture, activism, politics, Western psychology, and more. If you'd like to support Ethan's podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Ethan. Uh, Hi, everybody. This is uh, Ethan McTurn. This is the Road Home Podcast. Welcome. Uh, Welcome back. So for uh, this episode, uh, I've been thinking about it for a while. I wanted to have a conversation, especially in light of the pandemic, on all all of the topics of loss uh, and impermanence uh, and everything that's related to that grief, heartbreak, et cetera. Um, and, uh, so it's a very tender topic and I was thinking about who to invite on to have it and, uh, uh, settled on my my dear friend, uh, who's also a Buddhist, uh, psychotherapist here in the, in the New York area, who's very smart about issues of, of grief and heartbreak and also, uh, able to go into deep, dark matter, which I hope to do today, uh, in a tender way, but also maybe with a little lightness and, and humor, uh, cause, cause I don't want to just have the podcast episode be, uh, depressing to everyone if you're, um, already in a difficult place. Uh, so I wanted to welcome my dear friend, Heather Coleman to the road home podcast. Heather, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me on. Uh, it's so good to be with you. Um, and yeah, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to talk with you and have an open conversation, especially about this topic, is it's it's also really a, an important one to me too. But um, yeah, I just want to start by saying that uh, you've been a great friend to me, <laughs> so my heart is open. And what better person to have this conversation with? Yeah, in front of a few, the the few thousand people who download the podcast, I don't know if they actually listen. I, I get emails from people that they actually listen and they appreciate it. So, um, <laughs> but even if it's just a conversation, we had a conversation just the two of us as friends the other night. So even if it ends up being one of those, and we've just press record, that's cool too. Um, but yeah, so I think about this because obviously the experience of grief, heartbreak, uh, death loss, loss of relationship, any forms of loss or impermanence is so embedded in the way people get interested in meditation or Buddhism. Like, you know, uh, I think probably one of the number one books that people are given uh, what, that gets them interested in meditation is like Pema Chodron's When Things Fall Apart. You know, there's there's no introduction to Buddhism that's like when everything's going awesome, you know, <laughs> when nobody's died and no relationships have ended and and you didn't lose anything. Um, so so your experience of coming to Buddhism was, you know, based or originally was based on uh, loss. Do you want to talk about how you got interested at the beginning? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm I'm somebody who. I think when I talk today, I'm going to speak as a therapist, um, but I'm also going to speak as a human being uh, who's experienced a lot of loss in my life. Um, you know, I first came to the path, but also my interest in becoming a therapist started when I was in the aftermath of uh, losing my mom when I was 22. And uh, that experience was just so formative to me and formative in my development and my psyche. And the place that I landed on after all of that was, if I'm in this much pain, and this was super painful, so I have so much heart for people who are in the middle of this right now, that other people must also be experiencing this kind of pain. 
you know, I, I think in my twenties, I was, I was somewhat self-focused like anybody would be. Um, and it was that, that first kind of, oh gosh, this is what people experience kind of realization. And it brought me to volunteering first, actually. I started to volunteer and work with people and then learned even more that this was a universal experience that people were having, that there was grief, there was pain, there was suffering, there was loss. Um, so it brought me into Buddhism and it brought me into being a therapist ultimately. Yeah. How, I mean, what would you, how would you define grief if you were trying to give like a succinct definition of the the experience of grief do you grief do you have a do you have a working definition oh my gosh that's such a hard question Ethan <laughs> <laughs> we have a really hard time like like uh identifying like like really simple questions that are simple experiences that we all have it's interesting how I know and I think that people have tried to package it and I know that there's been a lot of work to try and package it as an experience and I think that's why it's such a hard question right at first you know there's been a lot of information around the phases of grief and I do understand that I think that that still stands as a therapeutic working definition and yet it's so much more complicated than that um, complicated and simple because I think that it's just such a felt experience that in order to put that into just one word or succinct package, I think that's so hard to do. Um, mainly because you're running in and out of feelings through the whole thing. So if anything, what I would say about grief is feeling. <laughs> There's a lot a feeling around the loss that you experience. Um, and that I think is the universal quality that brings everybody together in the understanding that if you've ever had a loss, that is the experience, right? It's the experience of this really profound feeling. Yeah. Um, but how to package that is difficult, right? Because you run through so many uh, different kinds of feelings, right? Like sadness and sometimes depression and sometimes anger and sometimes bargaining and sometimes it's, it's a roller coaster. Yeah, yeah. Um, is is this, the source of grief is always like, it's defined in relationship to loss, right? Loss of time or usually loss of relationship right obviously probably the most prominent definition is this this loss of a person or set of people to death right but it is a more expansive definition than that it's um uh uh but but it it is some proximity to either loss of a person or i was also thinking in buddhist terms there's a loss of identity associated with grief like you you lose some way you used to rely on a sense of your own selfhood or your own identity that that is removed or shattered and then it's the aftermath of the feelings that arise from that loss or shift in identity right so so we're in the space of loss yeah and i think and and that's where i was really thinking today about the entire process of it why it's such a, a profound and important process is because at least and this is only my opinion and not to be taken as a, as advice and obviously if you're in the middle of grieving right now or in a lot of pain i highly recommend working with somebody on it um to me, it has been the single most profound experience in terms of a developmental shift in how, at least personally, I've related to myself and to other people. And, um, you know, as though, as though it just, it, it shatters something to such a degree that things break down and things fall apart. But then through that process, somehow the pieces come back together and they come back together in some new kind of form. Um, so I have to agree with you. It can be, it can be really disorienting, right? Because it's that the disorient, 
ending uh, experience and how you relate to yourself. It yeah. fundamentally changes from that that point moving forward. Yeah, I don't know how I don't know how it could be any other way. Yeah. Do you? I mean, I wonder because then there's also collective grief, like sort of you know the grief of what the world is going through right now, or where we don't know where it's going to be because we're pre-recording this podcast. But what's going on in Ukraine? This insane. Uh, climate report just came out, you know, so there's this like kind of potential loss of countries and societies and civilizations. And it's interesting because sometimes the loss feels so stupid, right? Th- that's the other thing about some, some loss feels just like they're just coming out of people not taking care of life properly. And then other losses, um, you know, for example, when you lose a parent, you know, they just like everybody loses their parents, right? Uh, eventually. So like mm-hmm. that loss is just part of life. Whereas the idea of losing human civilization to the climate crisis and maybe the collective grief we might have around that, that feels like a loss that we don't necessarily need to have, right? So some grief feels necessary and some feels like, I don't know, it's coming from our own ignorance or something, right? Absolutely. Though, I don't know, even, even within a sense of, of ignorance, like if we've done something, oh, this sounds so strange. If we've done something unnecessary, or harmful, or cruel, um, I think the hope is, even throughout that process, the hope is that it would land in a place of recognition. Right. If if anything, I think that's the fruitional nature of it is that um, even if it's coming out of a, a place of harm, cruelty, ignorance, the hope is that will that will open hearts eventually. Mm-hmm. The really sad part is if it doesn't. Mm. I, mean, I think that that's what I'm really sitting at, at least in terms of the world crisis and climate change and Ukraine. I can't even. Those kind of losses are unfathomable to me. And yet, you know, if anything, at least personally, I can, and I can only speak to, to how I feel, um, my heart, my heart is completely open. Mm. Would you, So that being said, you know, with your clients or with friends, definitely with students I work with, I feel like there's definitely more weight on people there's definitely more heaviness right now than say i don't know i i go back to the a shift at the beginning of like the trump era and then you know when the pandemic started a different kind of weight or intensity came in but would you say just say through the pandemic that that you're experiencing more grief in the people you work with or, or is it, is grief always there? Is that the Dharma of grief that it's just like always a human thing or is it increasing right now? I don't know. I don't know either. I, I think that, I mean, at least, at least what I think I've been seeing as a general, um, and I know from everybody I speak to, uh, you know, whether it's friends, family, whomever it is, um, the pandemic hit people really hard. That I know is an experience. And I think collectively, at least what I'm seeing now is that the grief aspects of it are profoundly sinking in. Mm. Um, if they didn't before, they really are now. Um and so, yes, <laughs> I, I know that it's probably always been there in some way, but I think that specifically with the pandemic and how much loss that's been experienced it's really highlighting that as an experience right now um and i i don't know i don't know why this is coming up but just the the difficult experience of having been mostly isolated through all of this is probably one of the biggest 
parts of the grief that people have been experiencing. And, you know, at least in terms of my hope, in in order to start to heal some of the grief that's been occurring, um, even though obviously a lot of that can be done on one's own, um, even though I wouldn't recommend it doing it at all on one's own, um, my hope is that it's a, a, a shifting point if people just start coming out of isolation. Yeah. I mean, is that a basic, that seems like a basic structure of depression is that, uh, that the isolating quality of depression, like one of the ways to work with that is to remember and reconnect with your relational self and seek support because we are such social creature, creatures. So, I mean, yeah, is that, is that part of the, the recipe for how you, you talked about volunteering when your mother died and you talked about moving into these very, I mean, it's interesting because one could say that Buddhism is about dealing with your own aloneness, right? Um, mm-hmm. And actually being able to handle the fact that we are actually always alone, right? Um, that uh, our parents, our friends, our teachers, et cetera, can't actually be fully with us. We are alone with our own beings and our own minds. But do you think that's always part of the healthy way of working with grief? It's finding the healthy relational self and participating in community or friendship? Because it seems like that's what you went to, you know, to work with your own grief in your 20s. Yeah, so I can only I, I can only speak to that in my personal experience, and you know I can't give a direct recipe for how to work with grief. I can only speak to. I want <laughs> answers, Heather. <laughs> want all the answers. I'm gonna be super vague and, <laughs> and blank slate with you. <laughs> People are tuning in. That's why we listen to podcasts. Is we want succinct, definitive want answers. <laughs> The, the roughest thing about grief, and I've actually discussed this amongst my therapist friends, is that, you know, even for us at the other end, it's a lot of sitting with. <laughs> so we want succinct answers around it. I think everybody does, myself included. And a lot of our job, right, is to just show up for and be with. Yeah. So you know, if you're talking about that in meditation, if you're talking about that as a Buddhist, if you're talking about that as a human, as, as anybody, yeah, it's this experience of sitting with those hurt and wounded parts. Um, all of those parts, I think grief and loss oftentimes brings up some of our, our rawest, oldest parts. And Sure, we can sit with that alone. Um, and I think that you can do that. You can sit with it alone and reparent yourself. You can, you know, hopefully become a loving parent towards yourself. Um, even though a lot of people go, what the heck does a loving parent even look like? <laughs> That's the beginning of that, right? <laughs> um that's why it might also be helpful to do it with other people, right? Because, because we could try to offer that to ourselves and um, generate that and, you know, hopefully even um, come to our own secure attachments. But I think it also happens in relationship with other people who can offer love and care. I've been in so many respectful, healthy, loving communi- communities that, reflected me back in such a loving way yeah yeah. Uh, it feels like the loss can be held by a greater a greater space yeah yeah so so one kind of grief is when someone dies right i in some ways i think that's the most obvious sort of grief right that that this person was there now they're not there and um there's no, uh, there's a finality to it. I mean, obviously we have all of these theories and different spiritual traditions about how, what happens to consciousness that makes it continuity. You know what I'm thinking about? Because Thich Nhat Hanh recently passed away all of his quotes about continuity, um, no birth, no death, you know, the cloud becomes the rain, etc. I mean, he was the master of just these, phrasing of continuity but but from our standpoint the grief of losing a person is that like this person used to walk the earth i used to talk to them i can't i could not do that anymore 
And how do I hold that sort of vacuum or that loss? There's another kind of grief that I've been talking to a lot of people about experiencing, especially during the pandemic, which is the the heartbreak of losing a relationship. You know, and this was the initial, wasn't just my experience of this, but this was the initial thought when I wanted to have a conversation with somebody on the podcast was, uh, I'm hearing about anecdotally tremendous number of breakups happening over the mm-hmm. pandemic. And that's something last year, the, the breakup of my marriage and things that I, I had to go with through with that. So, um, you know, and that brought up, I mean, it's, uh, by, by all, um, by all estimates, people say that we're handling it, you know, very respectfully, like friends, we, we have each other's interests at heart. We both fairly quickly came to the conclusion that there was just something that wasn't working, but that we did care about each other. Um, And so it's been a very painful situation, but I'm, but a really uh, healthy situation at the same time. Uh, But it makes me think about like what happens when there's a grief where you used to be in a certain type of relationship with the person and they're still walking the earth. In fact, they might be like, you know, (laughs) in your neighborhood even. Um, I've heard a few stories about people breaking up and then they can't move because of the, you know, financial situations of capitalism. So you break up and still even like live in the same home, which feels like the most difficult uh, Dharma practice in that, in that sort of space. But what's, what's different about that style of grief? Cause that, that seems to be the difference to me, just structurally, like there's the grief of losing someone who's no longer on earth. And then there's the grief of losing someone who's still walking the earth, who you could talk to at any moment and be like, Hey, you know, I love you. Or we used to love each other and now things have shifted. And, you know, um, when we talked a couple nights ago, you said you're not hearing as many stories in this about that. And this may be where anecdotal experience kind of fails us. Cause I'm my, and it might be cause I went through it last year. So I'm hearing tons of stories of breakups, but what, what is different about the grief of a breakup? That's so hard. Um, I don't know if I have, you know, again, coming back to answers, any great direct answers, albeit the first thing that comes up for me. Um, hmm, I do, I do understand that when you lose somebody to death, there could be an inventory that's taken. It, that is possible, but it may be it may be to a different or a lesser degree to when you're going through something like a divorce or a breakup, because as that person is still there, I'm wondering if you are more forced into a place of having to look at how you've been in that relationship. Because there was something that contributed. Yeah. Um, And also, hopefully, it will push that person, though, you know, we don't have any kind of responsibility for what they end up doing, um, into a place of also seeing their part, right, in the dynamic and also maybe even the dissolution of it. Right. And that isn't in any kind of shame, blame or attack sort of mode, even though, you know, I think in the beginning when you're you're divorcing, let's say it's very easy to be in that um, and maybe even for years, maybe you never come out of that. Um, But I think that that might be a little bit of a difference in the processing uh, in the sense that when people break up, they really take heart and they they do a a review Mm. right what really happened there to me that's very different than let's say um losing somebody to death even though of course you could you could have feelings about that obviously about how that relationship went um i feel like if somebody is still here it's that ongoing review that continues right so if somebody's still here, there, there's a possibility of, it feels like there's more possibility of a healing process 
to the grief. Not it doesn't necessarily happen. I mean, I know people who ended relationships, you know, many, many years ago, and they're still, you know, holding on to anger and resentment. And, um, uh, you know, sometimes you, it's hard because I, I'm, I'm not a fan of the phrase used in Buddhist circles, let it go, because there's a, I think there's a subtle aggression to the idea of letting something go like that. It's supposed to leave where I, I prefer the phrasing, let it be right. But there is sometimes when you see somebody who hasn't sort of moved on from a past hurt, there's there's a little bit of thought in my mind sometimes and i feel this way towards myself when i notice myself holding on like dude let that shit go you know <laughs> like um but uh but there is that chance when there's a grief where the where the people are still here even if they've shifted right because we're we're not actually the same person day to day or year to year or, you know decade to decade um, but there is a chance of sort of, as you say, taking inventory and seeing like, okay, what happened here? How did things shift? How did our identity shift? Um, and, but you can't actually talk to, you know, those who have departed. I mean, there's all kinds of spiritual ceremonies where you might try, or you might, people say they get messages. I don't know if you feel, uh, and this might be too woo for you. If you ever feel like, for example, you're in contact with your mother. Um, but people talk about that all the time, not in a unscientific manner, you know? So, um, but there's still the, the personal part of it. There's still this shift in identity, right? There's, there's a loss of an identity, you know? And for example, just to share, uh, what I, I'm very grateful to, to my ex and, you know, I think we've done a, a really good job getting to a, a place where we both actually remember that we care about each other. But I had to go through this period of a kind of loss and I had to do this alone, really. I mean, with, I have a therapist and I have friends and I have really good mm -hmm. tools and practices, but um, where I had to realize that for me, what it was, was this identity of wanting to be good at marriage, wanting to be good in a relationship because, you know, I have a history there. I am an uh, only child, uh, child of divorce. And part of me want to be like, I can do this better than my parents did, you know? And um, uh, so there was a loss of that, right? Maybe I'm not so good at this, you know, or, or maybe that's not, it's not a good or bad situation, mm -hmm. I know, but, but I had to do some inventory on my with myself with a, a loss of a perceived identity, right? And and that work is kind of ongoing in my life. So, um, yeah, I mean, don't we with grief? Isn't that always part of it? The self reflection of like, what was I holding on to? Because really, what we're losing, we are losing a person, but aren't we losing a definition of our own identity from a Buddhist standpoint when? when any of these situations ends or shifts? I'm not, I'm not sure. But when I was really, when I was really thinking about breakups, the first thing that came up for me um, therapeutically, just thinking, I, I love internal family systems and Dick Schwartz and all of that kind of work. I'm not yeah. trained, wow. so informed. Yeah. Lots of, lots of, uh, lots of Buddhist and Buddhist people are, are all about internal family systems therapy. Yeah. Yep. I'm sure, sure y'all know it. <laughs> um, I, I love that because, and I'm, I was also thinking about, oh, is there a difference in, in when you're breaking up and what parts get kicked up? Um, as opposed to, let's say losing somebody and what parts get kicked up. Probably. Do you want to just, do you want to just share a little bit about just the basic model of internal family systems? To my mind, it's very, uh, closely parallels the tantric Buddhist model of the self or energies of the self. So sure. I, I mean, and hoping I don't butcher it. Sorry, Dick Schwartz. Um, but just to, but just to say that, yeah, that we as people are made up of parts, um, rather than belong, rather than being any kind of solid part, right? Like oftentimes we over identify with a part of ourselves and think that's who we are. Um, it's that there's a system of parts that are working together to make a whole. Um, and then often those have been internalized or developed along the way, right, to make us who we are. Um, 
And so, so just speaking, I, I mean, I won't, I won't go into the whole part system, but just what I was thinking about, is that enough there? Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> but, okay. that's so, so just considering what parts I was thinking really get kicked up or that I'll just take breakups, right? When you break up, this is kind of the, and that's why I'm so sorry if anybody is breaking up right now, because it's just, it's so painful. It's kind of like the mother load of pain. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about pain. This is this is the big one. Um, so you know, it's the time to probably be the most gentle with yourself um, because it is so raw. Because what I think it does is it kicks up, it kicks up the most vulnerable parts of yourself, right? Like all the kid parts. If you have any kid parts, you think that you know I'm unlovable or I'm un- unworthy or you know, feeling, feelings of abandonment or hurt or any of that, I think that all really gets kicked up. So in terms of identity, right, I think it really calls to the surface what you identify with, um, who you actually think you are, and, and then it puts that all into question. The good news in terms of the workability of all of that is that now you get to hold all of those parts in a different light, right? I think that is the the identity shift if you're to work through, right? Some of those parts will be kicked up, but then if they're Sabbath, if they're reparented, if you're gentle, if you develop compassion, I think that your, your identity ends up reorganizing Mm. right it's it's that it's that profound experience so if everything just went status quo none of us would care about anything and so it's just the profound experience right of of your ground coming out from underneath you right in the divorce or breakup or loss that that forces you into an identity reorganization and that's um and that is why it's the it's the ground moment of of a spiritual path right so that's that's i mean that that is the beauty of having a, a mindfulness practice or a path is that we take the um most difficult moments right that the the core kind of human moments where it just feels like it's where everything goes wrong you know, and we actually turn them into these sort of touch points for awakening. Like one of the things I, you know, uh, there's a lot of things about the story of the historical Buddha that I don't relate to, but, um, uh, you know, he's in in attachment theory. I think he would be an avoidant personality. And I think (laughs) a lot of the ways he framed the path of awakening were, were based on, so I was, I'm always like, this is the path of awakening for somebody who wants to avoid the world, you know, not to say that he didn't develop great, great tools and insights given that, but, but some of the parts of the story are so human, you know, and it's said that before he decides to leave and go on his spiritual quest, he's visited by four divine messengers, you know, and you could think of like, uh, you know, uh, a Christmas carol or like the ghost of past present, but nothing he's uh, visited by is, uh, abnormal at all. They're all human messengers. So the four divine messengers are, um, he sees a sick person. He sees an elderly person, right? He sees, uh, a corpse, a, a person who has recently died. And then he sees a, a wandering yogi, a, a spiritual mendicant who's left the, the city life behind. Uh, and these are the so-called divine messengers, but they're all just humans in different states of of being human. I mean, I I part of me wishes like he saw, you know, uh, like uh, a poor person, you know, uh, a, a person from a war torn region, you know, yeah. uh, a person ostracized because of their caste or race or you know gender, etc. But there's something so human about those four divine messengers and that that idea that that's you know when things fall apart, that's when you start a spiritual path rather than when you're like. I'm screwed, you know, and this is, this is when my life ends. It's like, actually, that's when humanity begins. You know, mm-hmm. it feels like a really beautiful reframe of the entire grief experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, and 
And if anything, you know, it it calls into if there's any kind of identity shift, the the hope, right? Kind of the fruitional quality to get back to that too, right? Is the is the path of having an open heart. Right. Yeah. Like hopefully that calls to your heart. And I don't know why it needs that level of disorientation before that happens, but <laughs> it's like you're down on your damn knees, like <laughs> crawling into an Al Anon meeting for your first time, or you're like splayed out on your bathroom floor, or you're eating pizza on top of a car, or you're. you're <laughs> I've done that one. <laughs> I've, done, I've done them all. You're at your lowest moments, right? And you go, oh my gosh, nothing has got to change. This is the worst place I've ever been. And I don't know why. Those are the moments that it feels like something takes over. And through the process, and it could take, I don't know, maybe it takes six months, maybe it takes six years, but but at least for myself, I can say that I've only come back to that. Those moments have helped me to reorient my heart. Yeah. And that doesn't mean I don't fall off my from that path or that I don't act fully sometimes or I don't say something dumb to somebody or, you know, I... I have done all of those things, but I think, I think from those cracking points, something cracked to such a degree that it's such a softness that can't be forgotten. Yeah. Does the heart need to crack open like that to be like, like why, why are we, why can't we just be like, oh, open heart is a good thing. Like I actually feel closer to my own humanity or to others or the world. Like why yeah. does it need to crack open? Because <laughs> I don't think it's intellectual, you know, to go back to when you really like, oh, wrap up brief in that one, you know, <laughs> in a succinct package. I think it's experiential. Mm-hmm. Right. It's the experience of what that's like. And and then hopefully the carrying forward of, oh gosh, others feel like this. Mm. Right. If I if I've felt like this in any period of my life, others must have felt like this. Maybe others feel like this right now. And then I don't know, maybe it needs to can hold more. Yeah. Well, that, that feels like a really important point because um, one of the best instructions I've noticed for how to practice when we're in a state of grief or loss is um, uh, is uh, to practice compassion for ourselves, but that's often not available to people. I don't know why it's really, really difficult to practice self-compassion, which is why I think some Buddhist teachers, some psychotherapists have really focused on that rather than generate compassion for, you know, the beings across the world or, you know, who are suffering right now. Uh, Just focus on compassion for yourself. But one thing that I've noticed makes it very available, as Pema Chodron says, is when you practice compassion for those in a similar situation to yourself, those who are just like me. And I remember this moment where I was uh, at the Shambhala Center maybe like six or seven years ago. And, you know, there were, it was a Tuesday night Dharma gathering that we used to have um, before the center closed. And I was, I was teaching that night, you know, there were about 150 people there and I was talking about this, you know, compassion uh, for those just like you. And I just use the example of like, you know, not um, being ghosted, you know, when you're, dating or when you're dating someone uh and i was like have you ever had that experience where you're like like sitting somewhere waiting for a text message and you know you're just not going to get the tech like the person's not going to call or text you i was like if in that moment you could just contemplate how many people in this town or city you know or state or country or province or world are sitting somewhere sitting in a cafe somewhere or in a bar somewhere waiting for a text message that they're not going to get, you know, and you could just see the entire room kind of just melt into this shared open hearted compassion, you know, and it does feel like the the hearing 
hearing of stories and connecting with people in a similar circumstance, the shared grief experience feels so important. Do you, do you agree that the, like you talk oh. about going to an Al-Anon meeting, like is that so, Sangha aspect important? A hundred, 150%. That's why, you know, when, when you and I were talking earlier about the aloneness of the experience, of course, you know, there is something to building the capacity to sit with your own experience and tolerate and hopefully generate self-compassion. So like you're saying, that's the, that's the idea of the mother load <laughs> again. What is the loving parent? Um, I, I really, I don't think that we can do it alone. I think that definitely the Sangha community having having accurate loving reflection from other people is what helps to heal and and will ultimately I think this, maybe this is a lofty statement but I think will also help to heal collective grief mm. yeah but the loss has to be acknowledged first right uh, the, like on the collective level, right? I mean, that that feels like a huge part of our political problem is there's so much grief in the space that there's an active blocking of even acknowledging, you know. Well, hence accurate ref- accurate reflection. Yeah. Right. And, and I do I do think the mirrors that you choose to look in have to accurate accurately reflect. That doesn't mean that people can't have difference of opinion. But when it comes to um, when it comes to matters of the heart <laughs> or something that's much deeper than that, the hope is that you would have accurate, loving reflection. It's it's necessary. You don't need a bunch of people around you gaslighting you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, in terms of that accurate reflection on a collective level, the sangha level, I mean. That's definitely a deficiency of a of a personal meditation practice, you know, and I've done a lot of work as a teacher in my life to try to create more relational spaces. You know, I, I work with people one on one a lot more than many Buddhist teachers that I know, except for the ones there's a lot of modern Buddhist teachers, you know, like yourself, who are psychotherapists, too. So, like, that's a way to work with people in a in a relational space. But it also seems Meditation is very personally isolating because we're trying to work with our own mind in isolation, although sometimes we can do that in a group retreat space, and that's very supportive. Psychotherapy, I know, has sometimes been questioned as incomplete because it's so one-to-one. There's that that sort of group reflection. So you, I mean, you participate in a fair amount of group work. Do you do you think a person needs to do both or oh, I don't I don't think that that's necessarily a need i think that that's obviously a personal choice though i would also say of course there's gigantic benefit in being in something like group therapy and being in groups of people and being in community um there is something about being held in that kind of space that i don't think can be duplicated even in the one-on-one yeah. At the same time, when you're in a group, oftentimes what happens is either the group has kind of one leader who everybody kind of points towards rather than pointing to each other, or um, there's no there's no mentoring figure, you know, a group that in a kind of all horizontal hierarchy position can be very mutually supportive, but there's no person you can go to with a sense of like wisdom or like there's nobody specifically guiding you through the experience so having a personal relationship with a therapist you get something of an expert like somebody who's actually knows how to work with your situation and is just there for you rather than some kind of mutuality right Mm -hmm. yeah albeit you can also be in group therapy where there is a group leader Right. <laughs> and, and right. that can happen. Um, but also in 12 step programs, obviously those those groups function differently too, because they're they're actually more supportive in nature rather than it being um 
that people are cross-talking or responding to, to you know, individual experiences in the group. Yeah. Which is why it's really it's really a wonder that those groups work to the degree to which they do when people aren't necessarily responding to each other directly. It's actually that that's why I'm thinking fundamentally, right, in terms of healing, um, just even in that format, the degree to which a group can support, even by saying nothing at all. I, I think it more has to do with a kind, compassionate, supportive, reflective space that can hold this experience. Yeah. And most, I mean, just to speak to 12 step, most people walking into 12 step, right, are experiencing profound grief. Yeah. yeah. Profound grief. Yeah. Any, any 12 step program. <laughs> So I want to, um, maybe a closing question that I wanted your comment on, because I, I hesitate to predict anything about our future, right? Even, <laughs> even the, the two weeks or so from now, when this, when this podcast is scheduled to, to go live. Um, but it does feel right now we're in early March, you know, 2022, it does feel the pandemic is not ending, but it does feel like there's this lightning at least of the the waves of the pandemic, you know, obviously knock on wood, there could be another more deadly variant. Although it seems like this arc of the, the virus settling into a less deadly form and the pandemic eventually becoming endemic, right. And, and life getting somewhat back to not normal, but a, a social life, you know, a in-person social life becoming more possible as time yeah. goes on, do you have any advice for people kind of coming out of the last two years of that isolation and all of the experience of grief? Like what, because it does feel like we're going to be in a huge mental health, no. spiritual health era coming forward. What, what are you advising people to do as we sort of take these baby steps back into in-person social life? Do you have any thoughts? Go slow, go gently, go kindly. Get out. Get out. <laughs> Get out there. Get out there. <laughs> Get out there. Uh, this is too long. <laughs> it's been too long. I mean, even if you were in the best of mental health, uh, tip top shape, it there's no way that this is, hasn't impacted people on such a deep level. And part of us, I think, you know, and please don't take my advice. Go see a therapist if it's necessary, which it pretty much is for everybody right now. Um, it, it's going to be the coming out and getting back to being social beings because that is what we're supposed to do as people. We're supposed to connect. That's part of, you know, living on this earth. So hopefully, I, I think just slowly but surely, you know, making sure that you're getting up and that you're getting out um, and reconnecting with friends. Well, thank you so much, Heather. It's, it's, great, to, uh, it's great to have you on the podcast. Uh, to talk about these very light topics of grief and heartbreak. I hope um, it wasn't too, as we said. I don't <laughs> it think it was too dark. dark and depressing for y'all. I mean, that might just be a coping strategy of mine to try to be overly playful. You know, and sometimes we do have to like look at uh, look look at the facts of life, and they're they're not always so um, superficial or so humorous. So, but. yeah, though I think it's both. You know, just to kind of end on that too. It's just, you know, um, it's the playful and the dark, and it's the yeah, it's both together. Um, so Heather Coleman psychotherapy.com <laughs> is Heather's website, Heather Coleman uh psychotherapy.com, if you want to check out uh her work. Um and uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. We'll, we'll have you back sometime or we'll just talk about this over dinner sometime. <laughs> Love it. Thank you for having me. It was a great talk. Thanks, Eve. Yeah. 
All right. Well, for the Road Home Podcast, this is Ethan Nickturn. Thanks so much for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time.